And it's kind of that crawl, walk, run approach where at minimum in that middle section, it's walking humans down a path where they're doing less work and they're getting more results faster, where they're able to digest something, you know, call it that AI assistant, if you will. It's like somebody doing the work for you and you're actually reviewing somebody else's work to validate versus doing everything from running reports to analyzing reports to matching data to then getting to, oh, is this a match or not? Without supplies, there's no surgery. Without products, there's no patient care. Welcome to Power Supply, the healthcare supply chain podcast focused on helping you navigate the intricacies of logistics, purchasing, contracting, and supplier relationships. Each episode, we speak with healthcare executives, supply chain leaders, and innovative entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the loading dock to strategic sourcing, from buyers to the C-suite, and across the enterprise, we tackle the real-life issues impacting the healthcare supply chain. Whether you're tuning in for conversation or inspiration, we're glad you're here. You're just in time to hear it from the source and stock up on insight. So sit back and plug into Power Supply. On this episode of Power Supply, Hayes, Gary, and I are going to speak with Cody Fisher. He's the EVP and Strategic Advisor at Concordance Healthcare Solutions. We're going to be talking about the applications of AI and dig in real specifically on getting data standardization and making that cleansing effort sustainable, especially when you're looking at just how healthcare organizations continue to grow through mergers and acquisitions. And finally, is there an application to help us work more closely with our supplier partner, Hayes? I've talked to Cody before, and he is really just a wealth of knowledge on how to take AI and make it usable and applicable. And there's going to be some people listening just they're not familiar or comfortable with AI. I think there's people that still don't understand the true applications that could be had with AI. It's incredible where we're going to go. He gave us some great examples. We're even going to talk about CPFR. Do you know what that is? So if you don't, you better stick around. Ah, Now that's a teaser. We'll be right back after a short break with Cody. Stay with us. Bam! I'm Hayes Walder. This is Gary Skinner. And I'm Justin Poulin. From the studios of Healthcare HQ, you're listening to Power Supply. All right. Today, we are speaking with Cody Fisher, EVP, Strategic Advisor at Concordance Healthcare Solutions. And we're going to be talking about, well, In the end, data cleansing, like keeping our data clean is not easy and it's really about making it sustainable. So here's the buzzword that everybody has heard, AI. And and a lot of people out there may have dove headfirst into this and really gotten a good picture of all the different capabilities of AI. And some others that may be listening today may just know that it is a buzzword in the industry, but it definitely has the ability to transform how we do business day to day. Cody's an expert. Cody, thanks so much for coming on the show. Absolutely, Justin. Great to be here. Always enjoy these conversations and different ways to collaborate and ask questions, answer questions. And I'll probably ask more questions to you all than you'll to me throughout the the session today. So why don't you just tell everybody about your background? How did you arrive in your role at Concordance and and talk about your experience with AI and, and why you think, you know, it's such an important part of, you know, the future of healthcare? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll kind of keep the background short. We've been in the healthcare industry, healthcare supply chain a little more than 10 years. And prior to that, I was in, in banking. Most of those years, believe it or not, were in finance responsibilities, which I always tell people, you know, I've taken the finance hat off, but my brain does still speak and think in numbers. But, you know, that balance of, you know, having meaningful conversations, financially impactful conversations, but also being able to collaborate is kind of how I'm wired. So the last couple of years, I really transitioned, call it post 
post-pandemic. I know that's a bad word, but post-pandemic transition from finance responsibility more to strategy, which has allowed me to balance kind of those two facets of my brain of think like numbers, but be able to collaborate throughout the industry. And right around that same time, we began partnering as an organization with Palantir and really embarking on this journey around data and analytics and AI and visibility and and all those call it buzzwords in the industry. And and it's lent itself to us developing a platform with Palantir called Surgents. And it's, it's really embarking on a journey to not only connect concordance as a distributor, but to really connect the industry together as internal organizations to themselves, as well as to organizations and their their trading partners. So that's kind of the the how and the why I've gotten so involved with data and analytics and, and AI over the last several years. I will throw a disclaimer out here. I am by no means the highest technical person you're going to talk to AI about. I really kind of translate AI and data into how we can use it throughout our day-to-day business within organizations, as well as, again, across trading partners. So I'm probably more of the the blue collar. I'm going to talk about it, how we use it versus kind of all the, the detailed and the technical stuff of like, how does it actually work? Cody, without question, you're clearly the expert of this group on AI. <laughs> it's not Hands it's down. not even close. So pat yourself on the back there. Well, but thank you for being here. And again, AI obviously is taking our, our the world over right now. And so I'm excited to hear more. What's the, what's the most common application of AI in healthcare specifically? It's a great question. I mean, you know, this is by no means my expertise, but I'm going to say what I think we hear about the most and what always amazes me is the AI application and clinical, right? And that can be product, how products used, how surgeries are done. I, that, that to me is kind of where we see in healthcare as a, a really big industry, the biggest application. And it, frankly, it amazes me. I think we're a bit farther behind of how do we apply AI and automation and all those, again, concepts to the supply chain. I think, again, you know, the traditional sense is how do we make the healthcare better, if you will, through intelligence and and AI. But I do think from a trend perspective, there are definitely organizations that are embarking on the journey of how to leverage AI, how to leverage visibility in ways that we never have before. And to be frank, and I think we've probably all experienced this, the audience on the phone, I don't think we can go to a conference now. I don't care what the topic of the conference is or who's there without talking about AI and automation and and visibility. Well, all right. So let's drill in on AI. I know we're just kind of teeing up the conversation and we've had some discussions around AI and Cody, you've been on the, the ARM podcast to provide a pretty high level overview of of the potential of AI and how it's being utilized today. But I want to talk about this data cleansing piece specifically, because I feel like, you know, especially as health systems have gotten larger, you can't be in a position where you talk to hospitals regularly and not hear or come across one every single week that's implementing an ERP, which means huge, large data sets. And then how do we utilize that data? And is it usable if we can't keep it clean? And so I think a lot of times when people think about AI, they hear things like, you know, we can get some actionable insights. We can, you know, maybe crunch the numbers, so to speak, to do some things in a much shorter period of time than it would take an analyst to try to do it and all the spreadsheets all by themselves. And we hear those things, but I don't think we talk a lot about making the data set sustainable in that is the data even accurate enough to draw those insights from. And a lot of times we're trying to manage humans to make sure that that data is continuing to be, you know, accurate and reflective of, you know, what we're really doing throughout these large health systems. And so I just kind of want to know, like, Specifically with all of the mergers and acquisitions that have been happening, what's the conundrum with large data sets? It's a great question. And, and I'll, I'll kind of lean on your, your comment to the data cleansing piece and then circle over to large data sets. I think, you know, as an industry, we typically think of, you know, data cleansing as it relates to item masters, right? Or PIMS or whatever else organizations call, you know, their 
for lack of a better term, you know, their Rolodex of items that they can buy, that they're on contract, et cetera. You know, when I think of large data sets, I not only think of, call it item masters, I also think of like your inventory, your orders, your utilization of product, you know, the contracts that you have. I mean, we could have a whole session on like how complex are contracts and the healthcare supply chain and, and how can we really not, I'm not even going to go down, down the path of optimize, but really go down the path of how do we know we're even all using the same contract at the right time, right? How do we know our prices match? How do we know, you know, it kind of makes me chuckle sometimes if yes, you, you know, a manufacturer, distributor, and a provider, how much that provider buys of product X, I would almost bet there's three different answers, right? Um, all day long. And, and it's like, those are head scratchers of, of how do, how do we get there? But how is it so complex that, you know, some of the most simple tasks actually have different quote unquote data? I think to your point, Justin, on, on mergers and acquisitions, and you had mentioned earlier, you know, the transitions to, to new ERPs, to cloud base, to whatever it may be, it just raises the level of importance of having solid data. The call out I'll probably make, and this is coming from, you know, the conversations we're having around the industry from the surgeon's perspective of how do organizations leverage a platform that allows not only the data cleansing and ingestion and visibility, but also that scalability to it. I would, I would warn organizations to not wait for their data to be perfect to embark on whatever innovative journey they're going down. And what I mean by that is, if organizations are waiting for their data to be perfect, they're in fact never going to get started, right? I think we do have to, as organizations, understand that, you know, there always will be variance in our own data at some level. The The benefit of innovating while, call it cleansing simultaneously, is done correctly innovating is actually going to highlight where your data may not be clean versus just doing a data cleansing project. You can actually tackle both if you understand or if you have that kind of mindset, if you will. We're going to give ourselves grace on this innovative journey while we're also cleaning our data or understanding where our data might be in the most turmoil. You know, Cody, you, you said... Uh a mouthful there, and I'm ingesting every bit as I can. It's better than I can than Hayes, because I know you got to slow down a little bit for Hayes to kind of capture that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, Cody, really good information. I want to take it back, and just for the listeners to hear a little bit more detail to understand the difference between human intelligence and artificial intelligence, and maybe give a, a specific understanding. I, I know during these M&As that Justin was talking about, mergers and acquisitions, that like a distribution might change. Like you have inventory controls at a DC that show up at the hospital. And can you give an example of how just like a par level or an inventory control from a supply chain perspective, how AI would feed into that and help support it? Cody, just maybe it's really for my fourth grade mental status, Hayes, if that's all right. But Cody, please fourth grade. give me an example. Please. Oh. <laughs> Pre-K. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And fair, and fair, you know, fair question, you know, an example from call it a, a par or storeroom perspective. And, and, and again, I think a lot of the industry is, is here where it's, you know, Hey, go in and set a par level, go in and set an inventory level. And then on a quarterly basis, go back and say, well, how's that doing? How's your right? max levels? You bet. Yep. Yep. Am I ordering too much? Do I order every day? Do I order five times a day? Oh, let me adjust that. And I'll come back in another quarter and do the same. To me, I'm going to echo your comment, Gary. To me, that's the human kind of interaction, if you will. Oftentimes that also is, hey, let me run a report and see everything. And then I go back and make changes where, you know, the, the AI component of that, or I'm going to say more of the automated systematic component of that is set the parameters on how you want to manage your supply chain. And anytime those parameters are being broken, you're getting alerts to where those parameters are broken. And then you get to make the choice. Again, I'll say the crawl, walk, run approach is in the middle, you still get to make the choice. Do I want to update something or not? Right? Maybe it was an anomaly, or maybe it is consistent. And I want to do an update. The run approach would be, hey, 99% of the time, I'm always adjusting a par level. Well, heck, now we can actually just say, take the human out of it completely. And that par level is updated automatically, right? So, you know, kind of the, that's the spectrum that I see personally of run report to 
let me interact with some automation to fully automate when, again, the user and or organization is comfortable with those decisions. Well, Cody, the run perspective, I love it. And this the setting the parameters to run. I mean, I think about the labor efficiency that you're talking about is amazing. The support of that to move it forward. And then you can work on other things like meetings that make sense and, and, go and be proactively versus reactively, getting this set in the background to move forward. So thank you for a little bit of clarity. I think that's helpful. Absolutely. So I, I kind of want to keep going on that mergers and acquisitions piece. Like you said, item masters, but like, you know, a lot of times that you're bringing in another hospital that's on a different system. And so the data is not even the same format. And I know one of the biggest challenges for a health system as they get, try to get integrated is just getting everybody to talk the same language and make that data. Cause one thing you might have is you, you might have, an abundance of supply that's not being used. That's, you know, maybe it's even in danger of ex- expiring or whatever that all of a sudden you've got a whole, you know, another set of facilities that might be using that product or, you know, things like that. Even looking at contracts and pricing variations. I mean, that's a huge challenge. How does AI, you know, assist, you know, people in supply chain with getting through that? Because, I mean, I know of one not too far from me that, you know, onboarded a significant number of hospitals over like a four year period. And I feel like for the next five years, they were just trying to get all the data and the systems and everything aligned. You know, with the changes in the industry, especially in the provider network, you know, and call it the consolidation in some areas or, you know, building out additional facilities and others, I kind of break, you know, just as a a background of where my perspective comes from, I kind of break this into really three pieces. It's how do you get data from point A to point B? And in this scenario, it'd be from multiple sources, right? Multiple facilities, multiple hospitals. How do you get it from point A to point B? How do you analyze and understand it really quickly, right? And then what do I do about it? And albeit those can be like simple steps and there's many more in between. I can share again in conversations around surgeons and where providers are asking, you know, for, I'll say a remedy to current day problems, right? Today, a lot of providers are saying, I run this report from this system and this report from this system. And I do a V lookup to try to calculate or match everything that's perfect. And then I start going down the list to basically gauge what else didn't match perfect, but is similar enough, right? And I'm talking kind of items at this point. Justin, to your point, it can be items, it can be contracts, it can be utilization, inventory, whatever real data set you're managing, and, you know, first and foremost, I, I would say we can leverage AI and, and automation to pull data quickly and then accomplish the second point of what do I need to understand about this data quickly as well. And a, and a lot of those contracts are in PDF format is kind they of are. what I'm getting at, too. <laughs> you know, yeah. is there a way for AI to extract data from these PDFs and instead of somebody like tediously going through countless pages and some of these contracts are just ridiculously long and, and trying to just distill that down to the nuts and bolts of what you need to know when you're trying to, you know, compare, you know, the pros and cons of one contract in one facility versus another as they're coming together. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I will say I've seen some very powerful AI organizations that specifically, you know, manage or, or work to manage contracts. I've also seen, you know, in, in kind of our world within Surgent, some really powerful application of, you know, call it one singular app of many, right, that can ingest the contract into your exact point. Here's the important nodes that you want to know, or maybe even in a more powerful lens, how do you actually interact with the contract? And, you know, Justin, you could ask it questions if you want. Right. It can, it can really get to that interactive level. Even at a simpler level, if you're comparing item master to item master, imagine a world where, you know, yes, you have perfect matches of it just so happens that two organizations call a manufacturer by the same manufacturer code and have the perfect item and the exact same description. But what happens when all three of those things don't match? Right. And now you have to use some intelligence to start to suggest this isn't a perfect match, but based on all the parameters and the model and the language in place, we recommend it's an 80% match. It, it, it again, is kind of that crawl, walk, run approach where at minimum in that middle section, 
it's walking humans down a path where they're doing less work and they're getting more results faster, where they're able to digest something, you know, call it that AI assistant, if you will. It's like somebody doing the work for you and you're actually reviewing somebody else's work to validate versus doing everything from running reports to analyzing reports to matching data to then getting to, oh, is this a match or not? Cody, my brain's going like this right now. So if I, if I get a little sideways, bring me back. But I want to think about this from the contractual standpoint. A lot of times you pull in that AI technology, you find out there's tier levels and optimization and utilization. And I'm thinking in the world of the OR and I'm looking at my core down the middle supporting 10 ORs. Okay, so walk with me here. Think about like a total joint initiative, right? You're looking at contracts, you have all these vendors, spine, whatever it is. But are, are we able to take AI technology from a perspective, say you have a 10 OR facility and you're doing X amount of surgeries and X amount of total joints or spine procedures and extrapolate that aggregate amongst a system to start pulling efficiencies and inventory to support that? Or am I, am I way off or is it down the road or are we doing this already? I'm just thinking, I'm like thinking out loud right now, Cody. It's a great example. I would say I personally am aware of a few providers going down this path individually. I think the big question becomes, how can we help? And and this might be for the audience to think about, how can we help providers not do this in a project form, but in a scalable form, right? So it might be one provider at one OR core. How do you scale that across an IDN network? And then to maybe even take it to the next step, how do you scale that same visibility and intent? And I'm going to speak from the lens of effectively manage inventory or a supply chain. How do you scale that beyond just a provider? How do you scale that to your supply chain partners, to your transportation partners, to your manufacturers, right? What I will say is the technology is absolutely here and is able to do it. When we start talking down the path of something like forecasting and demand planning and all those fun lingo words that are very prevalent on other industries. And I think we're starting to make them more prevalent in the healthcare supply chain. We really have to consider the scalability piece, right? Sharing Excel files back and forth or maybe doing unique API connections. It helps and it's a start. It's really difficult to scale. And at the end of the day, to really make the the biggest impact, we need a platform or a solution that the industry, I'll say for lack of better terms, is relatively aligned to, and it meets the industry and the organizations of the industry where they're at, right? It, it's very difficult for the industry to adopt, quote unquote, one methodology or, or one standard. I think we've learned that in many, many different scenarios over many years. So flexibility and scalability, I think, is is what the industry needs when it comes to really connecting. And, and Cody, I asked that question because I've, I've heard it from a, a vendor community a vendor community that they're mapping and they're getting so many millions and millions of patients like this joint looks like this joint, this vertebral column looks like this vertebral column. I mean, the, the, the amount of data they're pulling in, I'm like, there it goes. So that's why I asked that question, Cody. You're on, you, you get what I'm saying. I see you. I, see you smiling. I, I, to- I totally get it. What I'll, I'll kind of say, you know, and maybe this is a practical example. We are embarking on the, on a journey with a manufacturer, you know, where we're really working not only with the manufacturer, but the providers that they support and service in terms of how do we bring that, that consigned or end user, if you will, visibility of inventory back to the manufacturer. And how does the manufacturer then change its service model or change its supply chain model in terms of logistics? to effectively get product from their point A to the provider's point B. And to your point, Gary, now even within the provider network, where do we start to flash those underutilized or overutilized inventories and items to, to most effectively you know, manage that at scale? So, so we kind of talked about you know, how mergers and acquisitions amongst healthcare can kind of bring that data together. But I know another area that is always talked about is transparency between provider and supplier. And, you know, there's a catch 22 there, right? That Like people want to share the data, but they only want to share so much data. You know, there's obviously a, a tension around just negotiating the best deal, you know, for both sides. And so, you know, working through that can be difficult, but what about utilizing AI to sort of integrate between provider and supplier? Like, even if it's just on the logistics side, like forget, forget contractual, forget, 
you know, spend. I, I got to think that from an operations and logistics standpoint, there's lots of opportunities to leverage AI to integrate. And once again, you're talking about data sets that typically don't match because they're thought of very differently, depending on if you're talking about the manufacturer distributor versus talking about the hospital that's utilizing the product. Yep. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, Justin. I think you know, again, we hit on kind of the mergers and the, the growth or the consolidation in the provider network. I think you hit the nail on the head with another way to leverage AI or, or, you know, scalable platforms to really push the industry to new heights. And, and what I will say is, you know, healthcare is an opportunity, not simply to catch up to other industries, but if we want to, we can surpass, right? I mean, the, again, the technology is here to really move the needle. In a general context, I think as organizations embark on collaborating in a different way, being, you know, how do we provide visibility through a platform versus reports that we feel like we have so much control over, right? I think that's where, you know, the industry today, what I will say, kudos to the industry all segments, manufacturer, distributor, and provider, I, have, I think have a much larger willingness to be visible than we did five years ago or even two years ago. I think the industry overall still relies on sending reports to unlock that visibility. And I think that's stemmed, personal opinion here, I think that's stemmed a lot of if I send a report, I have ultimate control of what's in that report, right, as, a, as an individual. I think that's why we lean on reports a lot versus... I want to connect my system. I want to connect my data. I want to leverage a platform to bring visibility together. So as organizations embark on this, I think, you know, a couple things really need to happen in those relationships. One, I think all parties in the relationship have to give each other some grace in two ways. The first way is we all have our own warts inside our organization and we're all going to learn together as we actually unlock visibility across organizations. I will say Concordance and some of its provider partners have been down this and are still on this path, right? So you have to kind of have that in the relationship of not everything's going to be perfect. I may show you some words, you may show me some words, but we're doing this for the betterment of the relationship and the overall supply chain. That's one piece. The second piece, I think... Got a high degree of trust here. Yeah, yep, high, de high degree of trust. And I think... Leaning on that exact comment, Justin, organizations, I think, also have to give each other grace if all organizations aren't willing to be totally transparent to start with, right? I think we have to understand and give each other some grace that it does feel uncomfortable to provide visibility, especially if that's being done at a system-to-system -system level versus, again, running reports and sharing reports. So, again, I think we have to realize that we're on a journey as individual organizations, and especially as we start talking about collaborating in a different way across the organizations. So those are two, you know, kind of general points that I would, I would say we see throughout the industry, you know, from a surgeon's perspective, we've seen them in collaborative boot camps and bringing organizations together to actually tie their systems into a platform. It raises eyebrows, but I'll say if the intent's there and there's, there's really a win-win value and understanding what that value is, a lot of those small hurdles or those kind of uncomfortable situations, they become small because the big picture is so much more valuable. All right. So I asked that question for kind of a closing teaser, the future of healthcare supply chain with AI, which would be, you know, can you define CPFR for us and why AI is so critical to kind of making that a reality? Because other industries do it. But healthcare really has struggled to do it. So, you know, what is CPFR? I talked a little bit about this on another ARM podcast with Joe Dudas from the Mayo Clinic, but that was when I got introduced to CPFR and he has some experience outside of the industry. Why does AI like all of a sudden make this a possibility for healthcare and and really make a symbiotic relationship between supplier and provider like much smoother? Yep. It, it, it's a great example, Justin. I think of, you know, from a healthcare supply chain perspective, what could we or what should, should we be working toward really in unison as an overall supply chain, right? Versus individual organizations on the supply chain. And so CPFR, by definition, collaborative planning, forecast and replenishment, 
I generalize it again, my blue collar, simple mind is like, this is actually what makes the supply chain work, right? The difference with CPFR versus demand plan and forecast that many or all organizations do a component of is you're really doing this not only within your organization, but across trading partners, right? That is what really drives the big difference and and how it's executed and ultimately how it becomes so valuable. To answer your question on how does AI, you know, really make this even more possible than maybe it's already been, or how does it make it easier in concept? I'll lean back on, on a couple of points I mentioned earlier. I think it allows us to not just ingest data across organizations, but it allows us to synchronize that data, right? What a manufacturer calls an item, what a distributor calls an item, and what a provider calls an item, most likely in their systems are not the same thing, right? They have different descriptions, different codes, different somethings. So in some way, shape, or form, right, we have to use technology to create some level synchronized data set. So that's the first part. And I think the power and the speed of actually analyzing and understanding that data from what are orders, what's inventory, how fast is it being utilized, and scaling that then back to now I have alerts, I get decisions, I get workflows that tell me, well, what should I do about this? There's unique pieces within the healthcare supply chain that I think do make it a bit different than other industries. We have a lot of SKUs, a lot of names to those SKUs. We don't have a unique identifier, which I go back to, you know, we need to be able to synchronize that data with and without unique identifiers. But at the end of the day, the the biggest impact I see with CPFR is, yes, it should take away and remove a lot of the reactionary work that the overall supply chain does today, right? More times than not, a constraint happens and then everybody tries to solve the constraint versus in a CPFR world, we're actually looking ahead and saying we think a constraint is going to happen. And again, this collaborative conversation actually occurs across the supply chain provider, distributor, manufacturer. And now we're collaborating together to say there's a risk of a constraint. How do we actually prepare to solve that constraint before it ever impacts us? Right. And a big part of it is the hospitals have trouble forecasting, right? You know, because it is healthcare. I mean, there are certain seasonalities, there are certain things there, but does AI help tighten up forecasts so that a hospital can like reliably predict within a certain variance tolerance back to the manufacturer so that the manufacturers can, because, you know, when you're, when you're manufacturing something, a lot of times they're going on a line. And then that equipment gets used for a different production run. And so like they don't just all of a sudden tomorrow say, Oh, no, we're running a new production because we, we, we know there's, you know, somebody just asked for this yesterday, right? They actually have to set up the production run. They have to plan for that. They have to evaluate other demands that are coming in that might use, you know, essentially the same assembly line or the same machines to be able to do that. So. Projecting out six to nine months reliably and accurately for the manufacturers, wouldn't that help with the back order situation potentially? Wouldn't that help with shortages, all the things that are plaguing the healthcare supply chain today? Absolutely, it would. I do believe, and, and I, I won't even use AI interchangeably here with forecast models. I do think, and I believe in forecast models by themselves are incredibly strong, right? So I, I think you know, AI really plays the role of how does data get into a forecast model and how do we react to that model so much faster than we do today within organizations and across. Justin, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? We're really not talking about trending out 30 days. We're talking about trending out six to nine months effectively to make the biggest impact for manufacturers. And what I was saying in my conversations with many manufacturers is they're doing what they can do for the industry for sure. And there is a lot of variables that they manage against. The more that the industry can provide visibility and forecast to manufacturers, the better we enable them to support the industry and the organizations throughout the industry better. I think there is, this is my opinion, right? There's the big long-term forecast projections. I also do think there is then that zero to 30 days of we have inventory in this massive network in the U.S. healthcare supply chain how do we most effectively use it where it's needed the most in the short term, right? So I think there is a long-term forecast play. And I think that's really the holy grail, right? My opinion, 
I do believe that there is a very, very big value before even getting there of how do we just effectively know that a hospital is going to run out tomorrow? We didn't know that until historically, if somebody picked up the phone and called somebody else in the supply chain and said, I'm going to run out tomorrow. We can create the visibility to definitely tackle that problem today in a, in a pretty short order. And thinking about, again, how are, how's inventory used differently? How does transportation or transportation lanes used differently? How do hospitals even use their inventory more effectively right across their network? Again, you know, we've talked about examples of there's 30 days of inventory in one location. There's zero days somewhere else and the zero days somewhere else is still trying to order it, right? Versus optimize it across the network. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can tackle CPFR. And I think from an industry perspective, we don't actually have to tackle it all 100% to bring value to the industry, which is exciting for me. Any progress will bring value to the organizations that are on the journey. All right, Cody. Awesome interview today. And I'm sure there's going to be lots more conversations around AI on the Power Supply podcast moving forward. It's really just a very hot topic. And we're talking about trying to do things faster and crunch it and really get some insights that maybe are really difficult to find. So, Cody, you did a fantastic job. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Looking forward to next time. That was Cody Fisher, EVP Strategic Advisor at Concordance Healthcare Solutions, talking about AI applications, specifically, you know, keeping that data standardization and maintaining it, making it sustainable, cleansing it, figuring out during mergers and acquisitions, you know, how can we make that happen more accurately, more efficiently, more quickly. And I really do, but every time I talk to somebody like Cody about AI, I just think about contracts and just paper. I mean, it's not paper, it's a PDF, it's scanned. Maybe it was paper when it was signed. You know, we're doing a lot of DocuSign now, but it still isn't really like usable formatted data. And so when you start trying to compare contracts, that's just so difficult. And I think the forecasting piece that we talked about at the end, Gary, is is a really important one when we sort of look at where can we get to from here? Yeah, Justin, I, I think Cody, I mean, that was the fastest power supply podcast interview I think we've ever had. It went so fast. And AI, I'm just going to say, if you're not on board, it's time to get on board. It is going to hit supply chain in a hard way. I think clinically, it's already there to their point, to Cody's point, and to you know, dive it into the finance piece. It's all downstream effect, to your point, starting at the contracts. But just dumping in the efficiencies to set the parameters of how you want inventory, just the information that was shared on how AI is going to affect supply chain moving down the road so we can create some efficiencies to work on some other things that we need to within our own organizations, I think is huge. The scalability was another huge part that he brought up. I can't wait to hear more about AI. I can't, I know it's happening. It's happening very quickly. And uh, Cody just brought a wealth of information to this power supply podcast. So thank you very much. Yeah, big time applications when you look at the workforce shortages and also the experience shortages, lots of retirements happening with executive senior leadership and supply chain. It's just I can see where AI can really help us stay <laughs> stay up as best as possible. So great job, Cody. And on behalf of Gary Hayes and myself, thanks for listening to this episode of Power Supply. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Power Supply. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing on your favorite podcast app or by downloading the smartphone app on your iPhone or Android. Simply search for Power Supply in the App Store or Google Play. The best thing about downloading the smartphone app is that you can access bonus content for certain episodes and view episodes in certain categories, like articles on the go and vendor spotlights. Are you following us on LinkedIn or Facebook yet? If you are and you love an episode or post, then let your social network know about it. Like, comment, or share our posts along with your thoughts and keep the conversation going. If you have any topics or guests that you would like to recommend for a future episode, just send us an email to info at powersupplymedia.net. We look forward to hearing from you. 